to smile to myself just now because I thought, what is the theme of this talk? And then I realised it was going to be an attempt to define love, what it is, what it isn't. <gasps> Something philosophers have been trying to do for I don't know how many thousands of years, so <laughs> it's a big ask for a 45-minute talk. But at least a sketch some of those themes to bring up some food for thought and hopefully for practice as well and also I also <laughs> not being ambitious in any way I'd quite like to talk about how um, I called it love already how love real love um, relates to all the different factors of the eightfold path because I'm quite sure that it's intrinsic to all of them, to the whole practice. It's a very central part of, uh, of Buddhist practice. Everybody knows that, right? Everybody, hopefully, apart from the way we, some nationalistic Buddhists, not really Buddhists, ruin the reputation of Buddhism. You find that in every religion. It's nothing to do with the real teaching. But otherwise, I think Buddhism is generally known around the world as a religion of harmlessness, kindness, forgiveness. Basic qualities that should be part of every religion and are part of the human heart. But in uh, the Buddhist texts, <laughs> um, the word metta is closely related to the word mitta, which means friend or friendliness. So some people translate uh, metta as loving kindness. Some people, I think Bhante Gunaratna prefers loving friendliness. Um, but it's a kind of benevolent and altruistic love that really is interested in the well-being of another, also in our own well-being. But it's a selfless kind of love. It's not self-interested. It doesn't say, I love you if you make me feel good. Oh, I love you if you make me happy. It actually says, I love you to be happy. I want to offer my love so that you will flourish, be happy, uh, be well. And yet it also doesn't make those demands on another. And um, I think examples in our own lives are the best way to portray it. My own teacher, Ajahn Brahm, is for me the embodiment of loving kindness. And I have a living relationship with such a great teacher that teaches me just through his, his actions and the way he relates to me. And um, one of the things he once uh, said to me is, I'm committed to being kind to you. And that showed me that an aspect of love is a commitment. It's not something that's just there. Of course, the seeds are there in all of our hearts, but real loving kindness is a cultivation. It's something that has to grow, something that can be purified, and something that takes that commitment, that energy that we invest in the welfare of another. And another very lovely thing that he once said, he only says these things about once every five years, so I have to keep them, <laughs> note them down, right? <laughs> he said, uh, uh, I'm always around for you, always keeping my mind on the lookout to make sure you're safe and prospering. And that's an expression of loving kindness, and you know that there's no clinginess in there. You, right? It's just he's on the lookout to make sure I am safe and prospering. And I know that if I sort of drop dead right now, which I'll try not to, uh, <laughs> as far as I can, uh, yeah, he might think, oh, that's a shame she was doing good things in the world and you know, helping people, but I think there'd be no personal attachment there at all. And unfortunately, one of the reasons the word love is unpopular for loving kindness is because we have corrupted the word through our attachment, through our clinging, through our sense of self-possession. The word love is corrupted and also rendered meaningless, right, quite often when we use it superfluously for things like I love cheese <laughs> or I love a particular TV programme or, you know, whatever else we might use it for, video games, I guess, if we're not my generation. <laughs> and so it becomes kind of meaningless and that's such a shame. So in, in the Buddha's teachings, uh, loving-kindness is one of the four protective, protections. 
it's an abiding, it's a place we can dwell. And it's almost something that becomes our character when we cultivate it throughout our lives. And it's interesting in um, some psychological studies, which I'm always interested in as well, that uh, they actually use the word protective in relation to love. So they did this study, I think, in Spain on babies that grow up in loving environments. And they said they were neurologically and psychologically immunized by love which meant that when they grew up and had to face distressing situations in their lives and, you know, the general things that we go through as human beings, maybe breakups or loss of a job or a home, that they were uh, much more emotionally resilient than those that didn't grow up with such uh, a sense of secure attachment and love. So that shows that, you know, we can't expect ourselves to have heaps and heaps of resources inside, it does very much depend on how we've been, uh, on the love we've been shown. And yet it can be cultivated, it can grow, and that has also been shown to be true. It's uh, loving kindness, the practice of metta meditation has been shown to have great effects to relieve PTSD, depression, and also bias. It can dissolve racial or um, gender biases. Very important that they practice this in monasteries as well. Because, <laughs> mm. you know, unfortunately this creeps into any religious institution, sadly. Um, but loving kindness can reduce all of these things. And I think one of the reasons for that is it's so closely related to the understanding of non-self. It's so closely uh, a consequence of wisdom. You know, into seeing that there is no essence of a being inside. Um, everything that arises, arises due to causes and conditions. Uh, if I was in your shoes, whoever you are, I may have turned out just the same. In fact, I think I certainly would have done, because all we're seeing here is the products of conditions, aspects of nature, natural phenomena rolling on due to causes and conditions. So, But we can change those conditions, and that's the beauty, which is why we can cultivate love. Before I get too much into that, though, I did want to just sketch a little bit more about uh, the history of love that I've been reading recently in a book called, uh, by Simon May. And he talks about the different uh, types of love in Greek philosophy. <laughs> and they had quite a broad understanding. They talked about um, erotic love, like passionate love, which is called eros, romantic love, if you like, which, you know, does contain love. It's not that it's because of the clinging that there's no love there at all. But interestingly, um, I suppose neuroscientists scientists have found out that uh, in romantic relationships, there's a lot of dopamine and serotonin and even amphetamine for the first one and a half to three years. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Probably a lot, right? So shove it all into those three and a half, three years. <laughs> and then uh, well, hopefully it doesn't burn out. But what is necessary to maintain it then is shared interests, shared values, and a lot of attentiveness, a lot of uh, work at that relationship. And often having a baby is one of the things that keeps it alive. And this leads to uh, other hormones like oxytocin, which is like the love chemical, like the kind of um, the thing that connects us, which is there in platonic love as well. Then this one kicks in and that can keep the relationship alive. And then there's things like family love, which we touched at on before. Uh, certainly the consequences of not having that as a child can be very um, devastating and take a lot of time and, and opportunities, if you're fortunate, to repair. Uh, so there's that uh, family love. And interestingly, the Buddha did talk about metta as the love that a mother has for her only child. And sometimes people think, okay, so it's a mother's love, great, I'm practicing metta. But he went further than that and said, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so one should develop loving kindness to all beings. So it's a love that protects all beings the way a mother loves her only child or protects her only child. 
It's not just for me and mine. And that's the difference, really, with loving kindness and familial love. What else is there? There's love of love for strangers, which I find very beautiful. Zinnia. Uh, yeah, there's this lovely chapter in a book I like by uh, Bante Damika called I Was a Stranger and You Took Me In. Yeah. It's just such a nice phrase. And that was much more common, I think, in traditional cultures, in places like India where I've lived, yeah, in places like, even in Europe, in like Italy and countries that maybe have a very Catholic uh, culture. Still, people do tend to open their doors to the neighbours and you know, get together and share bread or whatever. On the trains in India, it was great fun. You'd be on the train for like 24, 36 hours <laughs> and sleeping you know, on this really dodgy little kind of bonk thing hanging down on, on chains <laughs> and trying to kind of protect your money belt because I hardly had anything in it anyway but it was all I had and uh, and the families would start to kind of talk to you and they'd get out the chapatis and the dal and you'd all be eating it together I, I was really into it after 36 hours I didn't want to arrive <laughs> it was really nice yeah you just got comfortable with whoever was there and uh so there's family love, friendship love, which is beautiful. And that's been one of the greatest loves in my life, the purest loves, really. My best friend, who I grew up with since the age of four, and uh, and now, I guess, my spiritual teacher, who is also what they call a, a spiritual friend, Kalyana Mitta, one who is uh, interested in one's highest benefit. And this is a very beautiful kind of love, very unconditional. And then, lastly, in the Greek philosophy, they have this thing called agape. I thought it was agape when I read it, but (laughs) it's agape. And uh, that is closer to a sense of unconditional love. So maybe also the spiritual or the um, community-based love that's wider than, you know, our own immediate circle. Um, But interestingly, that too is recognized as conditioned because all these states are conditioned in that they can grow. And that's the beauty of the practice. There's something we can do to cultivate this within ourselves. So I wanted to... Uh, oh yes, I'm supposed to talk about the, um, the uh, what it isn't as well. So just to um, try to cover that a bit. It's not a sentimentality. It's not a sort of saturine sweetness that's very kind of sticky and sickly, and seems somehow insincere. Um, It is associated with pleasant feeling, but it's not in and of itself a pleasant feeling necessarily, because love can also go to great lengths to sacrifice. And of course, you know, if if it had to depend on a pleasant feeling, again, it would be very, uh, very conditional. You know, I love you because of the way you make me feel. (laughs) Right? And this is often what love is. When we say we love a person, we just love the way they make us feel. And when those feelings fade, the love can fade too, if it's too closely related to that. So love is also an attitude. It's a way of looking, a way of relating to our experience in life. So it doesn't always feel great, first of all, but it does lead to pleasant consequences and results over time. So it takes time, and this is why we need patience with the practice. And we need to really... Another aspect of love in the suttas, actually, is that it's uh, not proud or demanding in nature. So we have to learn to be content with however little bit of well-being we feel. You know, even if it's very, very modest, very uh, humble, can we be content with that? not proud and demanding in nature, contented and easily satisfied. We're easily satisfied even with a little bit of calm, a little bit of peace in the mind. And even when there's no peace, we're satisfied that we're at least aware. <laughs> you know, At least we're aware of what's happening and right now we're all safe, we're hopefully warm. Even if there's no hot water, there's flannels in the cupboard. <laughs> So uh, that's not going to get us down, right? (laughs) So, and what else is not love? I had to check my notes. So again, this attachment, this possessiveness, a kind of exclusive love, because another quality of loving kindness is that it expands outwards. 
So it starts maybe for ourselves or for our loved ones, but then we spread it. So as I said yesterday, we first fill ourselves and then it can spill over. And the extent to which it can spill over is said to be appamana in the suttas, which means measureless or boundless. It can just keep spreading. And here we're going to go through a few different categories of so-called categories of beings, which are, of course, fluid, but we're going to practice with ourselves, with our loved, maybe a particular loved one or a couple of loved ones in our lives, maybe our teachers, parents or best friends, maybe a child, a pet, even a plant. I have lots of nice plants. They're really good objects of loving kindness. And then we go towards these uh, the people who are maybe not so close, Sometimes they're called the neutral person, or it could also be seen as stranger love, people that we don't know, but we understand that we share our common humanity with them. And then the more difficult people, so we expand the circle outwards. And there was this really lovely quote, my own teacher, I don't know, most of you know Ajahn Brahm, but not all of you. Um, I guess you could say he's a very traditional monk in many senses, and yet he broke out of the, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm trying to be tactful. I was going to say out of the mould. Well, out of the actual mould, you know, <laughs> the kind of gangrene of um, some misogyny in the Sangha, which still doesn't allow women to take full ordination. So uh, even though the Buddha, the Buddha did. So that's why I say he's a very traditional monk. He's going back 2,600 years to say this is what the Buddha wanted. And, you know, if women are asking for the full ordination, who am I to deny them that inheritance from the Buddha himself? So um, I'm currently the only fully ordained nun in England and the UK. <laughs> I'm probably, I don't know, maybe France as well, at least in the Theravada tradition. And... Uh, for facilitating the ordination of women, he was actually kind of thrown out of his circle, um, his particular branch of the Thai forest tradition, based in Thailand. And uh, at that time, there was a very beautiful poem going around the community by someone called Edward Mark Edwin Markham. I still haven't looked up who he is, but um, it was beautiful. It said, they drew a circle to keep me out. Rebel! Heretic, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took them in. Mm. <laughs> well, I thought that was just such a beautiful response because he literally had been thrown out of a circle that meant a lot to him. You know, it really meant a lot to him, the monks he'd been growing up with. We always talk about our life as monastics, almost like our birth. And then you grow up in Thailand or you grow up in India or whatever. So I grew up in India and Burma. <laughs> and, uh, and instead of saying, well, they kick me out, you know, they don't like me, so that's it, I exclude them from my love, then why don't we just draw the circle wider? And my goodness, imagine if we really could do that. You know, so many wars would you lose all their fuel if we could see that we were essentially human beings that, as I said yesterday, desire happiness and recoil from pain, you know, if we could see beyond those superficial differences and into our hearts, you know, we're human beings that want to thrive, then all these wars would really be seen for what they are as absolute atrocities. So the opposite of loving kindness and one of the synonyms is avyapada, which means non-ill will non-enmity, non-harm. Also avihimsaka, non-cruelty, otherwise known as compassion. And in the suttas there's a very beautiful um, description of that. It says, with a rod and weapon laid aside, abiding merciful and full of tender loving kindness for all beings. And that's one of uh, the consequences of compassion, of loving kindness. We lay down rods and weapons and we have that tender mercy for all that lives. It's also not only an antidote to, um, it's not only the opposite of, of ill will, it's an antidote as well, but uh, it's also an antidote to fear. And one of the first places it was used in the Buddhist text, in fact the chant that we did this morning, 
um, was given in response. It was a teaching the Buddha gave in response to these monks going off to the forest and thinking, yeah, we're up for this. You still hear all these stories of these super monks like, gung-ho, yeah, we're tough monks, we can go to the forest and like stay up all night. And <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, okay, women do that too, but we just don't kind of <laughs> shout about it. But anyway, sorry to be gender-specific there, but uh, I do hear a lot of tough monk stories from, uh, from my teachers sometimes. But in this case, these tough monks went to the forest and they forgot to do any loving kindness, so they were completely spooked during the night. There were all these trees and funny sounds and spirits chanting things and trying to scare them and make frightening shapes and smells. And, and they went back to the Buddha. Ah, we came back, we couldn't stay. And he said, that's because you didn't chant loving kindness. You didn't practice metta. And so... Perhaps that's part of why metta keeps us safe. People trust us when we have a heart of loving kindness and they don't feel afraid. So consequently they don't uh, retaliate or become afraid around us and try and push us away. So, Yeah, and I was also thinking, this isn't really from the suttas, but it's related to what I said before, that one of the biggest dangers to loving kindness, I think, is this kind of nationalism and, and uh, racial identity, nationalistic uh, attitudes that divide ourselves from others. And one of the biggest qualities of loving kindness, the most outstanding quality, is called Sima Sambeda. It means uh, breaking down the barriers, breaking down those boundaries we erect between self and other. And I think for me, as a bhikkhuni, sometimes being in monko, male-only monasteries, I do feel that sense of being othered. And I'm sure it's not to the extent that people feel on account of race in maybe white majority countries, um, you know, on account of religion in war-torn places. But still, it feels very painful to be othered. It f- makes you feel very small and almost as though you're not seen as a a full person in the way that the dominant group is. And quite often, you know, I've noticed references to minority groups as them and references to people in majority groups by name. So it's Ajahn this, Ajahn that, and then it's the nuns, you know, like over here. And this is a kind of othering. It's like you're not really... um, seen as as important or as credible somehow. And I think it's those kind of delusions of the being a a difference between us and anyone else that are the real danger to metta and that can breed hate. You know, we say it's kind of class hate or, or religious hate. It's just hate projecting onto some perceived difference that's actually... It's there, it's real, but it's very superficial compared to, you know, the vastness of our humanity and our interrelatedness. I don't often use that word because that's not what's meant by dependent origination in the Buddhist text, but we are interrelated in that we affect, intensely affect each other. A single word or, or deed that's harmful can can cause devastation. A single word that's helpful or kind can really change someone's life. So um, I am supposed to get into uh, how it relates to the rest of the path, but that leads into it because a deeper understanding of right view is the proximate cause for loving kindness at the level of intention. So right view is the first factor of the Eightfold Path. And uh, for those who are not so... Uh, well-versed in the Buddhist teachings, sometimes the English translations uh, may be a little jarring. The word right view implies that there's such a thing as wrong view, and it maybe sounds a little bit, uh, I don't know, uh, a bit like preaching or something. But in the context of the Eightfold Path, right simply means right in the sense that it's leading to the goal of the Buddhist practice. So it's leading to awakening, and in that sense it's right. It's the view that will lead to the enlightenment that the Buddha experienced. Um, So we do have to check 
that our understanding of the practice and of the teachings is on track with that if we want it to guide us in the right direction that the Buddha walked. So, And basically, in a nutshell, right view is having at least a preliminary understanding of suffering, that there is suffering, there is uh, stress, distress, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair, as it says in the suttas. And all of us will experience that, and that suffering has a cause. That cause is usually um, defined as craving or uh, clinging, but it's also the fact that we're born makes it inevitable that we're going to suffer. The fact that we feel, that we perceive, that we breathe, that we have a body and mind is going to mean there's suffering there. We die. We're born and we get sick and we die. Um, sometimes we have the conceit of youth, the conceit of health that you know deludes us from this fact. But if you do have a chronic condition or if you are getting older, it becomes clearer <laughs> over time. Uh, obviously, there's other types of suffering, like being separated from those you love, um, associated with those you don't like, those that are disagreeable, and mm. simply not getting what you want. That's suffering, isn't it? <laughs> Apparently in the Arab world, I don't know if this is true, I should ask Kareem, but <laughs> I don't know where this is or if this is a myth, but um, somewhere in the Middle East there's a saying uh, that's a curse. Um, the first saying, this is Ajahn Brahm's story, so I don't know how much poetic license there is. The first one is, may the fleas of a thousand camels infest your armpits. <laughs> <laughs> That's one curse. But the second one, which is supposed to be... No, actually the first one, the worst one, is may you get whatever you want as soon as you want it. <laughs> which is really interesting. Because we think it's not getting what we want that makes us suffer. But imagine if you just got what you want, just... There'd actually be no meaning to life. Anyway, I'll leave that with you to reflect on. And another aspect of right view is this aspect of the fact that we are conditioned and that there is intrinsically no essence, there's no self in here, there's no me that remains the same and persists and isn't subject to change and alteration. And again, if we could really have a glimpse of that, then maybe there'd be more compassion for those who behave in ways we simply cannot understand. You know, there'd be more self-compassion too, more loving kindness to all concerned. And we'd maybe stop seeing each other as victims and perpetrators, but all, in a sense, just struggling to find our way, some making bigger mistakes than others and some being fortunate enough to come in contact with the Dhamma and have a chance to, to learn, to train, having the conditions there, having spiritual friends. And then as a consequence of seeing a little bit of this suffering and uh, understanding, you know, that we do change, we can't fix ourselves or anyone else, the outcome of that is right intention, the second factor of the path. And the three right intentions that the Buddha describes are basically avyapada, which is again that non-ill will, which is loving kindness. And the second one is, uh, sorry, that's the second one. The first one is nekama, which means literally renunciation. It's got a bit of a bad rap in the West, I think. The word renunciation sounds a bit like cold and harsh and <laughs> a bit lonely. But really it means a kind of non-possessiveness, a freeing, a non-control, a letting things go, letting things be. And also it's so close to giving, right? When we don't possess, when we don't cling, our energies are freed to give to others. So I think of that as an aspect of serving, an aspect of generosity, an aspect of giving people the freedom to be who they are and also to change. So love is that which gives freedom rather than that which imprisons, that which possesses and controls. And then there's avihimsaka, which is non-violence. It's very close to the word ahimsa. It's actually the same meaning. Um, made popular by Mahatma Gandhi with his non-violent uh, action. 
to colonial Britain who were very repressive and oppressive to the local people in India. So uh, again, that's just the gentleness, you know, an aspect of non-cruelty, non-compassion, um, yeah, if you like, is gentleness, being really, really gentle and tender, with tender concern for all living beings. You have to do that when you see little beings, isn't it? If you pick up a little insect, it's so easy to squish. I have all these ladybirds in my room. It's really cute. They're hibernating <laughs> by the curtain rail and in the corner. Well, either side of the curtain rail. I don't want the coordinators to take them away because they really look happy there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I have to be very gentle with them. I actually don't disturb them at all. And then from these right intentions, you can imagine that if you're motivated by loving kindness, gentleness and uh, giving things freedom to be, then of course your actions of body and speech are going to be pretty wholesome, right? It's, it's pretty impossible to do something uh, cruel if you are motivated by loving kindness. Sometimes we might make mistakes because we're a bit clumsy or careless, but That's also an aspect of loving-kindness is mindfulness as well. We're actually careful about what we do and what we say. So um, living a virtuous life is, is in a way, the first expression of loving-kindness. I had this other tune going through my mind (laughs) just at the end of the meditation when I was thinking about love, how to define it. It was actually by massive attack. (laughs) <laughs> he says love love is a verb love is a doing word but it's chanted it's sung really nicely i'm not allowed to do that as a non but it's really nice and i think yeah love is a verb actually it has to manifest as action if it's just a sentiment i mean anyone could say oh, i love you miss you but how are you showing that you know do you give your friend a call when they're sick or do you just think oh dear i hope they get better you know <laughs> How are you showing, how are you expressing that love? There is this beautiful passage in the suttas where um, one of the Buddha's chief disciples, the Venerable Sariputta, um, finds a monk called Channa, and Channa is contemplating suicide because he's very, very sick. And the Venerable Sariputta goes to Channa and says, Live, Channa, live. I want you to live. He says, if you don't have food, I'll bring you food. If you don't have a suitable place to stay... I'll I'll find you a suitable place to say, live, I want you to live. And I find that a beautiful expression of loving kindness. Because Sariputta didn't have any clinging. He was a fully enlightened uh, arahat. So when he said, I want you to live, it was just purely motivated by concern for this channa, a venerable channa. And, uh, And he wanted to do that. He was ready to act. And these are the senior monks, you know, who obviously engender a lot of respect and people are serving them day and night but still they'll go out of their way to look after their fellows in monastic life and of course as bhikkhunis too we we try to do that that's the beauty of community so when we co-create that ethical space people feel a sense of trust they feel that those around them are harmless and don't want to hurt and you feel held you feel like if something goes wrong like i felt it this morning my stomach you might have noticed me burp a lot it's not just like I'm so loose, or, <laughs> <laughs> or my bacteria and parasite from India are expressing themselves freely or something. It's actually quite a chronic condition, very complicated that I won't go into, but um, sometimes it gets aggravated fairly easily, and um, so I was wondering, will I be okay here, like with the lack of movement and maybe the change of food? And, and then I went into the kitchen, and a couple of the coordinators were like, I've got your list, you know, can I get you anything else from the shops? And we're all here for you, you know, you have a bigger community than you used to now. And it was just so lovely to be received that way. Someone also put some tea outside my room. I can't drink mint, but whoever it was, the intention was very much appreciated. And this is an expression of love. It doesn't have to be like fancy and full of fancy words, you know. In fact, save the words, just show the love. So uh, it naturally leads to ethics. And I think that's one of the defining features of loving-kindness. It has this ethical aspect. Without that, it's not really worth the name love. 
And then uh, the next factor of the path, <laughs> I'm going quite quickly now, is um, what we call right effort. And my own teacher prefers to call right endeavor because it's more like how you direct your mind towards cultivating wholesome states. And effort can imply a bit too much force. Loving kindness, as I said, is, is quite an innate quality to the human heart. And, ma and many animals, too. I mean, they all protect their young, right? And they can be trained to do enormous service as well to human beings, like guide dogs or other beautiful animals that express their love. I even had a spider once in Burma, and... Um, a really big one, it was like, probably that sort of size, actually. Its body wasn't, you know, its body was like that. But then one day it had this funny white disc on it. And I, it was sitting on my wall for a long time. But when I saw that, I just got a little bit like, okay, that is a bit weird. And mm -hmm. I thought, I'll just take a broom and sort of sweep it off the wall. So I did it gently, but then it fell off the wall and it lost that white bit. And then I realised it was an egg. And the eggs have like hundreds of babies. And the spider crawled off to the corner really slowly. And it just kind of drooped. And it sat in the corner like all kind of grieving, I think, <laughs> for a whole week. Aww. It was so sad. It really taught me not to interfere with wildlife even if it does look a bit strange and um, after about a week it sort of came back again and started wandering around but that was really a lesson for me you know that uh, anyway I'm getting a bit distracted from the theme but it was a very beautiful lesson actually and a kind of uh, image that showed me that even spiders they do really care and protect their children and they want them to live you know so, uh, but yeah, effort can be a bit too forceful. Um, really, with the practice of loving kindness, we're just trying to plant the right conditions. Like here is a great condition, the conditions are perfect for the cultivation of loving kindness. So that part is already here. And we can continue to grow the conditions by our acts of body and speech towards each other and our goodwill even at the level of thought. Uh, but the other aspect of loving kindness is simply using a little bit of effort to remove the obstacles. And actually just having the conditions and removing the obstacles is often enough. So we don't need to kind of, you know, force metta to grow. It'll grow in its own time and it takes a lot of patience and gentleness again. So then we cultivate through the right uh, endeavour the wholesome states. We increase the wholesome states and as a result of that the unwholesome states uh, decrease and they can't even get through the door sometimes. If you have a lot of beautiful thoughts of loving kindness, the Buddha said, you know, it's impossible to have a thought of ill will simultaneously with a thought of metta. If you're having the thought, may I be happy, even if you feel it's not quite uh, sincere at this stage, <laughs> You're not, at least, thinking, oh, may I, I don't know, may I suffer, may I punish myself for all the bad things that I've done. <laughs> so it is a protection for the mind. And, of course, it goes hand in hand with mindfulness as well. And as the mindfulness develops, along with kindness, it can lead to ever-deepening states of stillness in the mind and states of real resource and peace, states that we call samadhi, right up to the jhana states, which uh, some people describe, in fact, especially in Christian traditions, they describe sometimes as union with God. <laughs> and that is an indication of the power of these states. These are not just light sort of experiences of piti or well-being or pleasant sensation. These are experiences of complete unity and overwhelming love. Some people say... You know, their experience there is like unconditional love. And if you're a Christian, you'll usually equate that to... It's so overwhelming and there's so little self that it's easy to see why they would say it's union with God. It must be something sublime, something beyond uh, this human realm. And in uh, the Buddhist teachings, they're called the Brahma Viharas, which literally mean the abode of the gods, uh, divine abidings. So it is a very sublime state. And yet the Buddha also said, you know, even if you practice loving kindness for a finger snap 
or the length of time it takes to pull a cow's udder. If anyone's ever done that, maybe. Has anyone done cow's udder? Anyway, I guess it's not long. And the milk comes out. (laughs) That's already better than giving so much food to the poor or to the monastics even. I shouldn't say that, should I? But (laughs) But presumably those generous deeds are motivated by loving kindness. But and also the radiance of a person with loving kindness, even for that length of time, is more than the radiance of the sun. So this is really, really powerful and it can cut through unwholesome habits, it can you know, protect the mind from unwholesome states and little by little the jar fills up with drops of loving kindness until it starts to flow. Sometimes you don't know when it starts to flow. But um, loving kindness can be a powerful way into these deep states of meditation. And the Buddha actually listed that as one of the benefits of practicing loving kindness. That one easily... Um, Ah, trying to use words that are not about gaining, but one easily experiences stillness, let's say. Stillness is uh, my preferred and Ajahn Brahm's preferred translation for samadhi rather than concentration, which sounds far too tight and forced. Stillness, where everything settles and the mind becomes completely clear, free from hindrances and bright and energized and the beauty of loving kindness is it has that extra quality of of happiness innately alongside it so it's a very powerful and fairly easy way into those deep states of meditation compared say to doing meditation on the breath although with breath meditation too when you're able to start letting go and really treating that breath with loving kindness allowing it to soothe and to just wash through the mind and you allow the feelings of pity to arise in relation to the breath and through letting go then also it can be a very joyful very blissful meditation but loving kindness in loving kindness the happiness comes a bit earlier so it kind of gives an incentive it gives the encouragement to carry on and uh, at the same time it really nourishes and resources the heart giving you that sense of well-being and ease and safety, which I think is so important to being able to settle into meditation. You know, you need to feel a sense of belonging, a sense of safety and ease. So the Buddha also said that uh, it protects you from fires and poisons. uh, The devas, as well as human beings and animals, love you. They don't fear you. You can experience this for yourself. I was uh, in a six-month retreat last year, was it, 2022, which ended up being a four-month retreat, really, because of a lot of busyness that came up partway through. One of our retreats got uh, the venue that we'd planned a retreat in basically closed, and I had eight people coming from overseas to that retreat. (laughs) So I had to come out of my retreat and put everything online, so the retreat kind of uh, came to an abrupt and early close. But during that time... I was living in this kuti in the forest with a whole valley to myself and about 100 acres of bush and loads of kangaroo families as well. All different families, I could recognise their faces, I gave them all names. (laughs) And there was this one family... Tawny, Fawny, and New Borny. <laughs> Tawny was the mama, Fawny was the teenager, and New Borny was the Joey, the little one in the patch. And at a certain point, the little one, come sort of early spring, started to take its first hops. And it was really curious. She would, Tawny, the mom, would actually come close to my cootie before it would take the hops, before New Borny would get out and hop. And he would always hop like around her to the back and then back again like that and then back in the pouch and I told my teacher and he said oh maybe she's um I said it must be because she feels safe here and he said oh it's also because she's showing the new one that she's safe here you know giving it that feeling of trust that uh here's a safe place to be and there was another time I walked back from uh I don't know maybe from breakfast because I didn't go anywhere else um and I came back and there were loads of kangaroo families around my cootie. So I tried to walk gently because I knew they'd disperse. And they all did disperse and kind of hop away. Except this same family who came closer. It was extraordinary. 
it was almost like they were giving me that gift of trust and showing that, you know, we're not afraid, we're actually coming a bit closer and we're just going to carry on grazing. It was really, really nice. So this is what happens when we practice loving kindness. Also, our faces get radiant. That's what we were saying yesterday. There's an actual anti-aging effect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm reminded of my teacher in Burma who was just just incredible, my, my preceptor, actually. And uh, how one of my first encounters with him was when he was walking into the monastery down a little path towards my kuti. And I literally had this sense of, I know why they say that the Buddha had light rays, different coloured light coming out of him, because it did appear that way. Mm. There was just this incredible radiance. It was so beautiful. I don't know if there really were different coloured lights, but it seemed that way. And that's also when we have loving kindness. It uh, endears others towards us, and that helps us to be of more benefit to our human and animal kind. So just to conclude, because we are uh, slightly, about right on time actually, um, mm-hmm. there are these two or three very special qualities of loving kindness in relation to the practice. And the first one is this ability of loving kindness to dissolve these barriers and boundaries we erect between ourselves and others. Sima Sambeda, it breaks those barriers down, whether racial or Um, class, social, gender, sexual orientation, whatever reason, but also the barriers between ourselves and people we love, people we don't like, people we don't really think about. It starts to dissolve those barriers so that our loving kindness is impartial and equal to all. This is a very, very beautiful quality that's so closely related to wisdom. Another really key one is the pleasantness of loving kindness, the way it resources us and the way it brings us that happiness in our practice and encourages us to let go a little bit more into the deep meditations. And then also, even as a wisdom practice, as a foundation for wisdom, it makes us emotionally ready for the deeper insights. And... I don't know everyone here, but I know it's a common experience in meditators that sometimes an insight can arise and the mind's still not quite mature enough to handle it very well. Um, Maybe the mind's a little bit brittle or um, it can produce quite a lot of fear. And a little bit of that's fine, but sometimes it can be quite um, a deterrent actually for people. It can can scare them and loving kindness is a protection for that. It, It resources the mind. It's almost like you have a cushion in the mind. It's almost as though you're creating a very positive sense of self, in a way. And then, beyond that positive sense of self, you're starting to share with others. And from there, with a big and expanded mind, then you have the resources to see non-self, to see through this whole fabrication of the idea of self and other. So loving-kindness is a... It, is, it isn't union with God. It can feel like union with God, but in the Buddhist path, it's not the goal. It's still conditioned compared to Nibbana, compared to the ultimate goal of the Buddhist path. It's not uh, enlightenment itself. But these deep states of loving kindness can free the mind of hindrances, free the mind of ill will, to the extent that we really do have the opportunity to see into things like suffering, the pervasive nature of suffering, and non-self, and impermanence, the inherent instability and unreliability of life, and for those insights to lead to genuine wisdom. Yeah, so we're ready for them. And then, of course, the freedom that ensues. So love is a freeing thing. It's a verb, but it frees. So may we all develop lots more loving kindness. And again, to remind you, we've talked the big picture (laughs) in uh, as much depth as I can fit in to this time. But uh, it's the small things, it's the small acts, it's the small gestures that build up. So take every opportunity you can to be kind. I think that is enough and how. Thank you.